Hallelujah. Amen. It's good to be here. Um, I was, uh, I worked yesterday, and then I, uh, after work, I had therapy for my hand, my fingers. I've been going for well, this be my second week now, and then I uh, got a little haircut after that. And when I walked in the door, I grabbed a piece of pepper jack cheese. I was starving. And then I got a FaceTime call from, from Dad, and he had asked me if I, uh, if anything on my mind, anything that was stirring, if I wanted to share. And I was like, ah, not really. And then uh, a couple minutes later, he said, all right. I, I shot him a text a little bit, a little bit later, and I said, yeah, I think I'm good to go. So that's why I'm up here. Um, you know, and I, th- I think the thing is, you know, if you um, look at things from the perspective of man, you think about, you know, being up here and being organized and having the right time limit and the right mindset. But that's all, that's all man, you know. And so if you set that aside and you uh, look at things from the Spirit of God, that is always flowing within you and you're, you're always meditating upon His Word and His Spirit. And so you really are. We're all, we're all, we're all always prepared to go. It's just setting aside those things that really don't matter, you know. And so I have had some things on my mind lately, and, um, uh, you know, I had my, my, my hand in, incident you know, probably, what, two months ago roughly, around there, a month and a half ago, March, March 4th, I think, on a Saturday. And um, I feel like time has gone by pretty fast. Um, you know, but uh, I was thinking about this the other day. I was like, man, why, you know, two, Lord, why, why two, you know? And, and, you know, long story short, there's always got to be a witness, you know, to one. And uh, Anyway, but the point is here, um, when I meet with my surgeon every now and again, he, he just checks up on it, and um, he actually is not a hand surgeon. He's a, uh, a spinal and a neurosurgeon, so it's really odd that he took the job on. Um, but uh, uh, one of the last times I met with him, it didn't really hit me what he said until a couple hours later. He had said... Um, this is probably three weeks now. He said, uh, you know, how's the hand moving? I said, ah, oh, the, the tendons are tight and um, the healing's going well. It's just it's hard to move. It's hard to grab. And he's like, the thing is, you just got to use it like it's there. He's like, you got to act like it's there. Just imagine those fingers are there and use it. Just act like they're there. And uh, sure enough, probably three weeks later, last week, I'm in with the uh, occupational therapist and there, there is no affiliation there, and I, you know maybe they say this thing all the time, but God speaks through through everyone, you know, if you're really listening. And you know, she pretty much said the the same identical thing that um, you know the reason it's uh, you know stiff like that and the tendons aren't stretched, and one of the fingers is actually starting to uh, heal the opposite direction um, because I wasn't moving enough. And she said, you uh, you just have to use it as if it exists, you know, and. Uh, I think we can all hear that, you know, in a sense that um, the victory is there. The kingdom is established in the heavens, and um, we just have to see it. And, and really what I want to talk about tonight is, is, is remembering where we came from, what our origin is. And uh, I like the uh, song choices Daniel had picked. Um, it's in our bones. It's in our being. Um, you know, we are not our own. You know, and so on. I kind of want to go that direction a little bit here. And I just had some notes laying around in my phone under little God notes I take. That's the title I take when I hear things and see things. So um, hopefully I can, uh, you know, share something with you this evening. But um, I want to uh, open up with uh, Matthew 6. You guys could turn to Matthew 6 with me. That'd be great. Um, and uh, we're just going to start from the top here. And I really hope, I really hope I can. Uh, share what the Lord has in my mind here. And so it's Matthew 6. Um, we're going to start at verse 1. I'm just going to read a little bit here. And it says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father, which is in heaven. The Father is very important here. I'll go back to that. Therefore, when thou dost thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they... Uh, may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. But when thou dost alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret. And the Father, which um, seeth in secret, himself shall reward thee openly. And so we get down here to what the world, you know, the Bible says the Lord's Prayer here. and You know, it, it totally is. It's the instruction from 
Jesus. And I want to look at this in, from two, two perspectives here. I want to ask the question, what is Jesus teaching and where is he teaching it? And um, I, for years as I, I read this, this here, the scripture, I always really just skimmed by um, you know, what, what he was saying. And so he says, And when you prayest, thou not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, and that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you that they have the reward. Um, but thou, when thou wast pray, enter into the closet, and when thou wast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in the secret, and thy Father, which seeth in the secret, shall reward thee openly. But pray, uh, but when ye, um, ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. But um, be, not there, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you even ask. What manner therefore pray ye? And so it says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And in thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I always really just flew past the first part just out of a repetitive traditional manner I guess when it says our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name and that's kind of what I want to um, work with this evening and I like this because this is Jesus like this is Jesus character speaking this is Jesus heart speaking you know and he's speaking to the nation he's speaking to the disciples he's speaking to us um, and so we, we kind of see as Jesus speaks his character here, because, you know, a lot of the time we see parables and mer- you know, miracles and um, those types of things and healings, but here he's speaking to the crowd and the masses, and, and, and he says this is how you should pray. Um, and I like here that his first words are, are the Father. This is our Father. You know, it doesn't take away or change Lord, Savior, Jehovah, or any of those things, but he says our Father, Right? And so it shows that he has this relationship with the Father. It's loving, it's caring, it's merciful. It's not just out of tradition. It's not just out of routine. It's not just out of religion. But he says, us, our Father, where have we come from? Who is our Father? Who do we speak to? Who has created us? But our Father. And it shows that Jesus has this, this kind of this intimacy, this love, this care, and his character speaking, not out of, you know, again, because he had to speak, but is speaking out of his experience and being in the presence of the Father, right, his relationship. And so I think that's important that not in prayer, but even just in action, just in thought, just in life exactly, that, that when we speak, when we act, when we think, when we meditate, when we pray, who is it that we are praying to? Is it, is it the God of, memory is it the God of tradition or is it literally the father the one that dwells inside of us I I think about this too my, my hand has brought up a lot of thoughts lately but um, I don't know why I was thinking this but I said you know if if Daniel and I ever had another child um, that child God willing is going to come out with ten fingers perfectly designed as God made it uh, this flaw this what happened to me will not affect that child because it's in the seed Right? It's in the design because the Father put it in the seed. The Father put it in the design that you know, he would have a prototype. He would have a man in the earth that would be just like him, designed as he intended. And so he prays to the Father, and he goes on. He says, hallowed, or, you know, our Father out in heaven above, obviously, ascended. Hallowed be thy name. And that word hallowed deals with holy, holiness and separation. And uh, kind of in English, in a sense, you can look at it as like he's saying, our Father who's in heaven, be recognized as holy. When we pray, when we act, when we speak, when we live, recognize God as holy and separate, as unique, as one of a kind. There is none like him. There is none like him. And so the Father has also put that in our heart, has also put that in our spirit, that he, if we remember, if we think of our origins of who produced us, of where we came from, <laughs> He will have his way. And, and, and I, the next part obviously goes on to talking about in there that thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But I like how there's a, a prerequisite in a sense that thy kingdom come, thy will be done is going to be established regardless. But before that, we must recognize 
who we are with and who we are in. Because without Him, without the Father, without recognizing that He is literally in our being, He is literally moving amongst us, He is literally giving us everything that pertains to His life. That is in us, that is in our being. And when we pray, when we act, when we think, when we live, we must consider that, we must be conscious of that. We're not just living for for a God that has no life, or for an idol, or for a thought. But this is literally the Father of the universe, the living God that created all things. And so, um, I think as he talks to the people um, here, you know, because this is a a lot going on here. You've got a a lot of oppression, and you've got the Romans, and you've got all these other, um, you know, Sadducees and Pharisees, and all kinds of religious intolerance and stuff along those lines. And, And so... A lot of things here are, during this time are taking place also in the temple. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the ark later um, that is uh, in the temple. But I see here and I, f- I feel what I, what I really heard when I read this is that God is, God is reminding the nation, God is reminding the people who they are praying to. And, and, and if that kingdom will be established in the earth, we mustn't forget that it is, you know, it is unto the Father, the Father's kingdom, exactly. Um, and so I think, in a way, he's reminding me, he's reminding us, he's reminding the people where we are and where we stand. Uh, Acts, Acts 7.33 um, says, um, I'll read it here in the K, King James, and I do want to read it here in the Amplified, or the message as well, but it says, then, then said the Lord unto him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou stand is holy ground. The message says, um, says it this way. It says, kneel, or sorry, it says, um, then said the Lord in him, put off, oh no, that's the, uh, I did not pull it up, I apologize. I changed it. But the message simply says, instead of take off the shoes, it says to kneel and pray. It says to kneel and pray. And I, and I think that what really caught me exactly was the holy place. Guys, we're standing on holy ground because we're the Father's children, right? We carry the holy ground with us wherever we go, wherever the presence of God is. That's where it is. And so when we kneel, when we pray, when we humble ourselves, when we speak to the Lord, we're not just speaking from an earthly place. We're not just speaking from the ground or from the dirt. We are literally speaking from a holy place because God has put that in our hearts and our minds. He's written that on us. Um, and so I asked the question, and, and, and this is kind of where I like where Daniel was, was singing, but uh, um, again, remembering who it is that we, we belong to, um, so Paul says in, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians, you are not your own, right? You were bought with a price. Titus, Jesus Christ, he gave himself to redeem us from the lawlessness and to purify um, for himself a people, for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. And um, In John 8, 4, 7, whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is because you do not belong to God. And uh, I think that's, uh, you know, God... God made us vessels, God poured into us not just to hold that, not just to house that, but to express that, to let it flow, and we'll see, we'll see Jesus do that. Um, Romans, right, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And again, this is all coming from the Father. This is all coming from the creator of the universe. Long story short, I I wrote down that they were speaking in one language, they were in one accord, They, they really were speaking, one of the versions says, in their native tongue. And so things will change when you remember who you're talking to and where you're coming from and where you're speaking out of. Um, And this was just a glimpse I was pointing out that uh, when they came together, when the Holy Ghost fell upon them, when they moved from that position, there was uh, a native tongue that they were recognizing and where their origin uh, has come from. Um, Psalms 57 talks about awake my soul awake my soul, and so on. And it's speaking about coming into alignment before you pray, before you act, before you speak. Um, and again, um, we do these things uh, really just out of, I don't want to use the word convenience or tradition, just nonchalantly, right? But, uh, you know, God chose us and put us on the planet uh, for his purpose, and he filled us with the Holy Ghost so that um, when we pray and so on, and when we live, we are uh, able to uh, speak from uh, the spiritual dimension. Um, yeah. So I'm going to go back to uh, Matthew. We don't have to flip back there, but 
I started to ask, where is he teaching this? So where is Jesus at when he's teaching this? And, you know, he's on the mount, he's by the Sea of Galilee, and I'm not thinking geographically so much, but um, Jesus is in the midst of the people, right? He, he's not with the religious folks. He's not with the priests. He's not uh, um, in the temple. He's, he's literally outside amongst the nations. And I think his mindset here is that you have to take that connection with God, you have to take that relationship with God that, that, that he opened up with that intimate relationship with my father. You have to take that outside the temple boundaries to a place that is broken or a creation that groans, right? The sick, the poor, or the oppressed, because in Revelation what happens, that's all reversed. There is no more of that. And so um, what uh, we can go down here to, um, oh man, go down here to uh, 2 Samuel 6. 15. Um, I'll just read real quick. You don't have to flip there, but uh, this is where um, David is bringing the ark. Um, the Amplified wrote and says, so David and all the house of Israel were bringing the ark of the Lord up to the city of David with shouts of joy and with the sound of a trumpet. And so they're carrying the ark, the presence of God, um, with joy into the city, right? And the, the presence of God, the ark's been carried through the wilderness. It's been you know, moved around by the, the uh, Levites and whatnot. And so eventually David brings it in, and I believe Solomon technically brings it into the temple. But they do it with joy and with celebration. You know, they bring the presence in with joy and celebration where it all began. But over time, and don't get me wrong, the temple, uh, I mean, there's sacrifice, there's, there's uh, offerings. Those, those things are good. There's order. There's description. There's clothing. And, and in a sense, the temple is it's fruitful. There's plants. It's a garden in a sense, and the presence is right in there as well. But over time, if you look at it, how it's being used, um, the traditions, the routine, the formalities, um, this is a place where the laws, in a sense, which, again, other side of the coin, are preventing people even from entering in. And so Jesus, I look at the parallel in a sense, where is he sharing this message? Our Father, right, above, right, um, hallowed be thy name. Bring the kingdom. Come, he's sharing this outside of the temple, outside of the boundaries. Um, right? And so later on, eventually, in Matthew 21, if you want to flip there, you can. Matthew 21, 12 through uh, 17. It says, And Jesus, he went into the temple of God, and he cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. But ye, you made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna, the son of David, they were sore displeased. And right, absolutely, completely opposite. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these see? And Jesus said unto them, Ye have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and suckling thou has perfected praise. Um, you know, in the, he, he speaks too, not in this scripture, but, um, you know, having the faith of children, right? Again, we've heard this before, but children, babes, sucklings here, they're not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're not, uh, they're not contaminated in a sense. They're, they're still innocent in a sense. They still understand their origin. They still depend upon the Father. They still depend upon Him. And, and so Jesus spots this, and then in verse 17, and he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. So he leaves the temple. He exits the temple. Um, and I think this is important here um, because, you know, we, being the temple of God, being created in his image and his likeness, and, you know, as you know, God dwells, right, in a temple made without hands, um, that in order to get out, in order to release the kingdom in the earth completely, in order to understand the full process and structure of what God is doing, we have to remember who it is that we are working with and who it is that dwells with us. It's the Father. It's the Spirit. That is who we are praying with. That is who we have to recognize that is holy. And, and, and therefore, Jesus here, he says, it's got to come out of the temple. It just can't stay in the temple. Once it's full, it's not just meant for holding on to. It's meant for expressing. The creation groans for it. Um, there's other examples. Um, 
John 8.59, and Jesus, he claimed to be God. You know, the religious leaders attempted to stone him. Um, he hid. He left the temple again. Uh, Luke 4.42, Jesus leaves the temple to preach the gospel. He says, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Uh, again, Matthew 12.15, after the Pharisees plot to kill Jesus, he leaves the temple, heals many people who followed him. It goes on, Matthew, Luke um, 6.12, it says, One of those days Jesus went out the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying. This suggests Jesus was gone from the temple again. And so I see this pattern, not against the temple, but for me is that Jesus is, is, is saying that, that uh, the seed, the power of God is within you, and it's not, not just about being satisfied with, with, with uh, me being successful or me becoming into my fullness, but it's about obviously that body. Like, we can't measure success in a sense with what happens to us. Like, if my hand decided to pop back up, um, that's wonderful, but that's not the full story. It's not the full story at all. That's just a, a little peek, a little peephole into the heavens, into the spiritual realm. And, and, and so God wants to release it outside of the temple. That, 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 again, not that traditional relationship, not that Jesus saves relationship, but that, that intimate relationship, that love that he started with, a father and a son relationship, right? That's what he's looking to release outside of the temple. And um, I think it's important that, uh, you know, we we'll point that out. Um, and so, um, okay, so, so back to Acts, Acts uh, chapter 7. I won't move too much more from here, I, I promise. Uh, Acts chapter Seven again. Actually, I'm going to go a little bit back here to six. Um, this is where uh, <laughs> pretty much just tormenting Stephen. Um, um, I'm going to go here. I'm going to say. Uh, I'm going to go at verse. I'll just go verse nine. So Acts six, verse nine. And then, um, then these arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of um, Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them C uh, Cilicia and. Asia, disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. They couldn't resist it. There was something pulling them, calling them, drawing them. It was, it was unique. It was not something you would see in, in normal man. That's because Stephen is pulling from the heavens, because Stephen is speaking out of a spiritual realm. Verse 11, then they uh, suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people. And the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses. This man sees us not to speak blasphemous words. He won't stop doing it against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Right? And everything that... Uh, Moses accomplished and everything that Elijah accomplished and David accomplished and the process they all went through is perfect. That is what God wanted. But Jesus has something greater and bigger that he will change the customs. He will change the room. He will flip this place, right? He'll, he'll turn it up, you know, he'll turn it right side up. Um, and verse 15, and all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as if it had been the face of an angel, because he's speaking out of the heavens, exactly, a repeated one, in the midst of chaos. And they can't help but listen. And so it goes on, verse 1 here. Uh, Acts 7, then said the, to the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in uh, Quran, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country. And from thy kindred, and come into the land which shall show thee. Um, then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dealt uh, in Sharon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into the land wherein he now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession, and to his seed after him. Um, I always find that interesting. I didn't really get it until now. But uh, he, um, Abraham was promised something here, right? The land, descendants, children. And he has nothing. There's no outward proof here that that's even going to happen. It says there's not even a place for his foot to step in the land. And so he, he at this point, 
All he can do is trust God. All he can do is have faith that God is going to fulfill his word and the promise that he made. Um, but if you go back a little bit, he said that um, God says to Abraham that you should get out of the country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Um, and so it's interesting because Stephen puts in here, he, he says that he didn't immediately go. It says he dwelt in Haran, we'll call it, if that's the right word, Haran. Yeah, right, until his, his dad died. Um, <laughs> right, right, and that's a process, right? That's right, he has a new father. And so, um, the, uh, sorry, I'm talking here and I'm, I'm losing what I'm thinking now. And uh, so he didn't immediately leave until, you know, his father died and, and he, he was really going to put on a new life and dwell on a new land and fulfill what God had um, put on him. Um, and uh, so, I, I, I think too, we're not going to turn that, in Revelation 19, I think again in 22, when John uh, hears the angel, the trumpets, or sees the light or whatever it is, he, he turns around and he falls down at the feet of the angel. Yeah, he fell down and the angel says, get up. He said, I'm a, I'm a servant with you. We're, 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 I forget what the exact word is, uh, uh, 19. Yeah, I'm just like you, 1910. I'm gonna, you don't have to go there, but it'll be. Uh, real quick, so I can get the right wording, uh, 1910 here. Um, yeah, I'm a fellow servant and, and of the brethren um, that, that uh, we have the... T- exactly. And so I see here, too, is, is like this idea that like these temporary moments in time, um, you know, obviously John, he, he is literally in Revelation. He's on the island, and, and who knows what's going on here, but he is uh, caught up, and, and he still he falls down because he, he sees another, an angel, a being, and... and you know, the, the, the angel, the being, the changed one there says, you know, get up. You know, I'm not Jesus in a sense. Um, but I'm your brother. I'm your fellow servant. And so, um, again, remembering that this, this is a small portion. It gets so much bigger than this. These little temporary moments um, are, are, are wonderful, but we have to continue on. And we have to remember that God is the Holy One. He's above all things. He is the Father. He's our Father. And he, he put it in our hearts to fulfill all things, not to have a temporary moment, not to have a temporary year, not to have 10, 20, 30, 40 successful years, but the Father, our Father, literally put it in the seed that we would fulfill all things through Him, through the Spirit. And, and so uh, we have to remember that, and, and we have to live when we pray, when we, when we live, when we, we, we speak, when we meditate. It has to be from that realm because that is before thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Um, John fifteen six again. You don't have to go there. Um, I'll read it for you, unless you want to go there. But John uh, fifteen six. Uh, that's not Jonah, man. I just need to start using a paper Bible again. These little little finger things aren't working. John John fifteen six. Sorry. Um, it says, "If a man abide not um, in me, he casts forth as a branch and is withered and." Uh, men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned and abide in me, and my words abide in you, and you shall um, ask what uh, we will and shall be done here in my Father. Again, I am reading. I wrote down the wrong verses here. Sorry, fifteen, sixteen, not 6. My goodness, I knew it was about the fruit. That's why you just got to shoot from the cuff sometimes, man. Um, you have not chosen me. This is verse 16. But I have chosen you, and I ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, right? This is eternal fruit. This is an eternal thing. This is not a temporary thing. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you that he love you. What am I supposed to ask in the Father's name? I'm supposed to ask his will be done in the earth. And so that uh, will remain. That is eternal fruit. That is, that is like real success right there. That's not temporary success. That's something that remains um, and then I'm going to kind of reiterate uh, here what I was talking about in Acts. Um, so he, Abraham remains in the land here, um, and he was promised that he would inherit uh, the land and he would have children and, and so on. And it does say that he was in the land um, for, um, he, and this is in effect what God told him, that his descendants would be aliens and strangers in the land. That's, that's from uh, the Amplified. 
um, belong, not be in the land belonging to other people, who would bring them into bondage and ill-treat them for 400 years. And so Abraham's promised the land and the descendants. And I think here, this will probably be, uh, we'll go to Genesis 12. I'll just start at verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of the country, and from the kindred, and from the father's house, and the land, and I will show you thee, and I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham, Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, this is where Stephen says he stuck around for a little while until his father died. But what, what I'm trying to get at here is that if we remember where we came from, if we remember the Father, if we remember who uh, is in us and who dwells with us and who moves us, um, things will change, things will evolve, things will move in a, a faster pace, as pastor's been saying, rapidly accelerating. So look what happens, though, when Abraham obeys God's initial word. Because uh, maybe we can argue, maybe the theology is there somewhere, maybe the scriptures are there somewhere, but I almost was like, why didn't Abraham leave, you know, and, and we waited till the father died because he had a new father. But I looked at this as, as Abraham dwelt in the land but the minute he departed from Haran, and yes, the, the, his, his father did die, Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, and his brothers, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten uh, in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abraham passed through the land under the place of uh, Sishem, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared. So when he leaves the land that God told him to leave, when he remembers what God told him, when he remembers what is in the seed, when he has a relationship, when I have a relationship, when I have this intimate connection with God and I remember where I came from, look what happens. And, Abram, uh, and the Lord appeared unto Abram right after he left the land, right after, in a sense, I remember, we remember fully, what the Father has put in the seed. It accelerates things, because look what happens. And the Lord appeared unto him, and said unto thy seed, Will I give this land? And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And he removed from them thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent. And having Bethel on the west, and Ai on the east, and there he builded an altar unto the Lord, and called it upon the name. And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. And so, um, my point is, is the minute he, a uh, minute obviously is just a figure of speech, but when he leaves the land that God intended him to leave, things immediately accelerate. God appears to Abram the minute he reaches the new land. He's transitioning. He's following through with the process. Um, and he remembers where it is that... Uh, I'm speaking he as a, as a body who remembers fully where he came, what the intention was of the seed, what the intention of the caring, loving father is. You know, things will move. Things will accelerate. The kingdom then, after, will be fulfilled or placed on the earth um, as well. Um, and so I, I'll just kind of wrap up uh, with a few, few just kind of a couple thoughts here. Um, we, we kind of saw, uh, you know, in Exodus, in a sense, um, God tried, I mean, like, I feel like, over and over to bless the people. And we know what happened in uh, Exodus and with the Israelites and unbelief and, and these types of things. And so God is, God is constantly just trying to get a people to recognize his name and live by his name. You know, think in the Bible how many name changes take place. Um, and the name is important. Uh, it's the character, it's the embodiment, and so um, it was revealed, um, and so on. Um, I thought about this, I thought about Pharaoh, um, how he would not acknowledge the name of God. And when he did not acknowledge the name of God, we know kind of what happened there. Um, plagues, there were seven plagues, for instance, and so on. So 
um, they compromised, in a sense, Israel, kind of compromised um, or broke the covenant. Uh, so instead of a kingdom taking place on the earth, um, they pretty much got Babylon and Assyria and a lot of these other kingdoms over time repeatedly. Um, and so I guess, um, and if you were to go on and read, continue reading the instructions from Jesus, the second half, um, the second half of that after thy kingdom come and so on, that's when he begins talking about provisions and forgiveness and trust along those things. Um, but I guess this, like before we request or confess sins or ask or, or these types of things, we have to remember that we're praying to our Father we're, 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 we're in the presence of our Father, and our Father has filled us. And um, when we remember that thing, we, we, we then remember our purpose, and, and therefore we can fulfill um, you know, the kingdom on earth, and, and he will have his way because we're, we're conduits. You know? God would have not made humanity if he, like, if he didn't want to have a people. right? He could have just fulfilled it instantly, but that was not... Goodness, that is not uh, right. That is not what a father, father does. Um, you know, so um, that's that's all I have.